Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, I'd love to welcome Evaristi. Evaristi, are you here? I think he's here with us so that we can start. Hi, Emilian. Welcome, Ernest. Thank you very much. So we, we got to to welcome you on this uh, talk. We hope to learn a lot from you for today. So I don't know how we are going to probably do this. So do you, do you have any presentation that you can share? So Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, can I start sharing? See. Yeah, definitely. Then we can um, start right away with brief okay. introduction. Perfect. So um, it's, it's uh, what is the time frame again um, for this is one hour? Yes, yeah, just one hour. Okay, perfect. That's good. But, so, but the the participants, of course, we have time to ask questions at the end. On yeah, absolutely. If you prefer that. Uh, so okay. this should be visible now, right? Right. Okay. So, uh, at least the plan for today is um, to give you an overview on how we have applied certain techniques for for um, for personalization that preserves the user privacy. So I will motivate why we did that. I mean, this is uh, part of this work was published last year in the Recommender System Conferences. Uh, and this is joint work with uh, Claudia, Igor, and Reshma. So <clears throat> if you have any questions at any time, feel free to interrupt. I'm happy to make it more interactive. We are, uh, I think, that a good enough group to, to keep it more uh, interactive. So let's let's start with this. So I'm I'm sure that you have used uh, recommender systems and maybe you use them in the in your daily life. So where where do you use them or where have you used them before? Anyone? Um, well, to, to ask, uh, yeah. This interesting. You there? So let me then pick names. <laughs> ah, yeah. So can you tell me a little bit more? How how do they work there? Or why do you think they are used this internally? So. Uh, I mean, if you can speak up, it would be better because I don't have to read the chat, and this would be easier. I mean, if you just unmute yourself and and tell me. So you have used it in several platforms. Do you think that they are useful? I mean, where are they used for? Seems Andonet hand is up. Please, Andonet. Okay. Uh, I think uh, personalization uh, is very uh, important to keep the users or the customers in loop because uh, first, like it learns uh, a lot about like our. Uh, personality, what we like, what we don't like, and it will uh, give us content and uh, uh, a different like a uh, product that the plat the platform has to offer for uh, specifically tailored to us. So this would uh, this would like allows us to uh, get important information that we actually want. But at the same time, I would uh, also see it. Uh, uh, it also poses some kind of uh, harm to people because uh, somehow it will prevent us from exploring different things. So it will just keep us on the loop of like getting the same things over and over again. Uh, maybe it's slightly different because like we might tend to like have some kind of interest on different niche or different. Uh, sort of like uh, for example in terms of like youtube or content we might uh, develop interest in like seeing different contents but it won't encourage people to explore new ideas because it is uh, most of the time i see it like uh it is more uh like based based on like what we already like not uh, mm -hmm. uh the other way so uh, that's why like uh recommendations yeah. are uh, good and like they also like smoothen the our experience in the platform 
So that's a good mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically okay. Yeah. So it's maybe useful, but there are some challenges there that it could be abused, right? So I mean, uh, would that be a fair assessment? Yeah. I mean, of course, like any technology, right? So I mean, that's uh, I think that is a good example and good overview. So. So they are used heavily in industry. So for instance, most of the revenue from Netflix come from the recommendation that they give you because if there is a, a, a huge catalog that you have to explore, it will be more difficult. So I would argue that they are, they are uh, one of their advantages is that they help us with this choice overload. So if you have a huge catalog to explore or a variety of products, then what happens if you don't have a, a a definite set, a small set of options is that you will freeze, right? I mean, there are studies that show that if you have like uh, seven categories of jam, you will probably pick one, but if you have 10, 12, 20, then you will freeze and you don't buy any and you don't know what to pick, right? And recommender systems tend to help us to do that. But uh, um, as uh, Andrew was telling us, yeah, there are several challenges, right? And one of the challenges that we observed is that um, in some cases, the uh, the companies that use this recommender system to drive revenue and engagement, they will try to they will try to capture a lot of data from you, right? And that's not ideal because uh, there could be breaches, and then your data is gone. And sometimes, even though they capture a lot of information, then it's not very clear how this is used for personalization. We conducted a, a survey asking, uh, for instance, the user how they perceive um, this, right? I mean, how they perceive when they visit certain uh, websites, if they uh, are happy with the recommender systems or they, if they knew if the data was collected in excess. And, and it was very interesting to observe that they actually say that and then they're actively taking action to prevent that, like using VPN or trying to use privacy preserving browsers like uh, like Brave and uh, putting this ad blocker. So there is a clear uh, uh, a challenge there for personalization to actually uh, be more, let's say, friendly and respectful from the audience. So, and that's uh, one of our motivations on this for for this um, uh, product that we built. Um, and it's not that it's something that you have uh, to hide. I mean, it's not it's not that you are like trying to be private because you have want to hide something. But it is not that you want to share everything. Right? I mean, this uh, privacy is actually your right and it shouldn't be abused by companies in the name of personalization. Uh, <clears throat> so we truly be believe that uh, we can do better and design algorithms and products that are private by default and uh, that gives also control to the to the users in order to adjust their preferences and not to be capturing these filter bubbles as Adam was illustrating before. I mean, if you are capturing this kind of a, always recommend, getting recommended the same thing, it's not ideal, right? I mean, you want actually some serendipity, serendipity introduced in the list of recommendations. And then actually what you want is this kind of delightful discoveries that do not compromise um, uh, your privacy. So we also believe that putting the people in the loop, like for instance, you as a user, but if um, if there are editors that create content that also give them the technology that is necessary to, to achieve these goals. And um, this particular product, we call it New Brief, and what it does, and I will explain in a, in a minute, is try to help publishers to with the challenges that they are facing. So. What we observed is that the new emergence of media, like for instance, uh, small newspapers or small media outlets that are very respectful with the people that do not um, that do not focus on a business model that is pushing you ads that are that are uh, very annoying and something that you don't care about, but they're more like a clickbait. So if you click there just uh, the, uh, the publisher will get some some little money, but it's not a very sustainable business model. So what uh, um, this new media movement is doing is mostly sharing their or or publishing very high quality content and uh, trying to engage more mostly with their audience, trying to create a business model that is more sustainable than 
pushing ads and on desired on desirable ads. Um, uh, the solution that we proposed uh, was a membership revenue model. So the idea was that uh, the publisher that will create this content will connect better with the audience and the audience will subscribe to these publications. And one of the uh, ways that they realize that is through personalized newsletters. So right now, if you subscribe to a newsletter, it's basically uh, a single newsletter for the whole audience, but that's not the... Uh, that's not very ideal, right? Because what you will have is some interest groups uh, um, among the audience that will be, uh, if you, they receive all the same content, it probably be not not uh, the optimum, right? So to give you an example, if uh, we were working with Silicon Republic, it's kind of the tech crunch from Ireland and um, and their audience is quite diverse. So they will they will publish mostly about uh, startups, technology, um, uh, funding uh, that you can get through through angels or VCs or and uh, machine learning, AI, um, and um, and um, uh, also more related to crypto as well and blockchain technology. So you see there are kind of diverse topics that, for instance, if I subscribe to the newsletter, not every single article that they that I receive uh, as part of, for instance, a weekly newsletter will be interested to me, right? And the idea was to help them identify this group of interests so they could put together personalized newsletters that they could send to these groups that are, uh, that are more tailored to their taste. Um, so yeah, so that was the challenge and, and, and the setup. So um, I hope that this is clear, but if, if it is not, please just go ahead and and, and ask me to clarify, right? So, uh, <clears throat> so giving you this context, we created this tool called New Brief, and the idea was basically uh, to be a recommendation engine that is used by the editors to create these newsletters. So this is not like a, Kind of uh, business to customers to the end users, but rather to business to business. Like uh, the editor will use this tool, and then they will create the newsletter. So to keep the human in the loop, and then push this newsletter to their to their corresponding groups. So I will go over the pipeline that we used, and and um, uh, to illustrate how this was realized, right? And then I will discuss the advantages that the, that the publishers um, um, uh, actually realized using this tool. So in the first step, we have what, what we call this vector as a service. So the publishers are mostly, they mostly deal with text, right? They have uh, text articles in their collection. So um, a way, I mean, but um, uh, since there is text, I mean, we have to have a way to represent this text in, in so the machine can under, understand and do something. And I mean, we humans can read and, and understand what is written, but the, the machines and the algorithm uh, need a, another format, right? That is not natural language, but rather some uh, representation. So yeah, in your experience, I mean, what have you, have you deal with, uh, for instance, documents or text documents, and how have you represented in your in your um, projects or in your experience at work? Can you give me an example? Ah, yes, just go ahead and mute yourself and, and shoot. Because, uh, Margaret, can you tell us? How? Um, from the projects we've done, I, I think we've used platforms like uh, Cohere and some other large language models like GPT-3 and BART to um, extract, to classify texts and topics and yeah get sentiments yeah. from from it uh yeah so from the text how did you represent them the the um, uh, so you have the text document right like a kind of news article or uh yeah social media ads or any text and then what was the output of the model 
Um, it was classifying. Uh, the the one we did was, uh, uh huh. So there was. Okay, I'm trying to remember the project well and just structure. Yeah, sure. Just a moment. Mm -hmm. Um. So we there was. Um, can I take a few minutes and I'll be back? Yeah, yeah, no worries. I mean, it's it's uh, the question, I mean, you are in the right direction, right? I mean, you have the text, and if you wanted to do something like a task for classification or sentiment analysis, you cannot just input the text because the machines are, are not intelligent enough, right? I mean, they're quite stupid, and then they don't understand text. So you have to have a representation. I mean, you mentioned that you use some language model, and the output of the model is basically a vector, right? I mean, it's... Uh, it's a vector uh, that is a dense vector, not sparse, right, with several dimensions. And these dimensions capture some information about the text that is there, right? And it's basically the first step that we, we that we did. So from the whole collection of articles that, are, that were in the repository of the editors uh, and, and this um, kind of magazine, right, uh, we converted into embeddings, is called, right? I mean, this kind of repre vectorial representation of the text because then you can do something useful, right? I mean, in the next phase, uh, what we did is to do a segmentation. So in this segmentation step, uh, is basically clustering the, those articles. And the way that you use it, right? I mean, we use um, several uh, clustering techniques, but the basic one is k-means, where we specified the number of clusters that was around five, so not, not many clusters, and then, we discover this structure of the data, I said, right? I mean, you will find then a cluster that is more with uh, startups, the other one that dealt more with um, uh, with machine learning. And then we identify this structure from their collection directly. I mean, uh, um, they, of course, use categories to assign to the articles and that were manually assigned. But what we discovered is that we're in some ca categories that were not very very used or they didn't write about too much. So, I mean, discovering this destruction from the data was very useful. I mean, and what I mean by discovering the structure from the data is basically identifying these clusters of interest uh, that were reflected in what they published. Um, and with this is kind of a proxy, right? Because the the, um, the hypothesis or is that this magazine uh, will write about something that the uh, audience care about. Right? So, I mean, discovering the topics that they write about is because they were targeting a specific uh, group uh, in their audience, and that's why we use it this way. So, um, have you used clustering techniques in, in the work that you have done? Or, um, and can you give me an example how have you used this clustering? Yeah, we have uh, 20 participants, so I'll start picking names then. What about you, Tasty? Tasty? Tasty Haley. Sorry if I don't pronounce your, your name correctly, but I mean, uh, someone that has used Clustering in their projects or? Well, I mean, if uh, if they f if if like as an advice, if you find like you haven't had the time before, if you have not used the tool before, you can also unmute and say it, we it's it's our first time. Maybe Ernesto can shed more light on it instead yeah. of like keeping like silent, because this has to be more engaging and also interactive. So. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the idea uh, precisely. Thank you, Evaris, for the clarification. Because if I'm the only one talking, then it's very boring. Generous, I see your hand. Um, hi, good evening. So, um, I think I remember a task that we did, which involved using k-means clustering to find the number of customers. Uh, we were working with data from a telecom company and we were trying to find out what customers have the same um, social media interest or 
the same kind of browsing behavior. Ah, so that's that great. Can better, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, so that we can better target the customers. Okay, that sounds that sounds uh, great. So I mean, it's also for seg audience segmentation is heavily used, right? So I mean, we use it very similar here. Here, the content was segmented, but the idea was to have a proxy of how what the uh, interest of the audience was. So that's a great example. So the next step uh, that we use is called this um, uh, explainable AI or NLP service that we created, and it's basically annotating the the text with uh, the entities that are recognized, right? So, I mean, if you have a text, like for instance, if uh, uh, the name of a person like Elon Musk and is, is in the text, this is not like uh, any other text, right? It's basically a person. And this name entity recognition or the name, name entity recognizer, like NERs, can recognize that and tag them as a person, right? I mean, also institutions like the United Nations, for instance, if it's nation, it would be recognized uh, as an organization, also places. So for instance, if um, uh, Amsterdam is mentioned, so that's recognized as a location. So this uh, um, uh, this effort that we did, did for the annotation, the idea was to surface these extra bits uh, and tags of, um, of pieces of information to the editor so they can make also a decision on on the articles to include, but also to push it to the readers uh, so they can also understand why something in, um, some articles are recommended to them, right? I mean, this kind of trying to explain the recommendation because that creates more uh, trust to the system. So I mean, that's that was a part of the pipeline. So um, the next one is what we call candidate retrieval. So um, the objective of any recommender system is that from the whole collection, for instance, in this case of articles, there were hundreds or thousands of articles, is to create a, a ranking. So that is a, very, a short list of articles that reflects a particular interest. So if you think like, a, uh, if we identify certain clusters of interest, the idea was to come up with a short list um, uh, of articles to include and a specific newsletter to be sent to this uh, um, to this uh, segment of interest, right? So, but the issue is that if you do this ranking over the whole collection over and over again, it's not very efficient. So, what the candidate retrieval phase does is to create is to fetch from the whole collection a set of uh, a subset, uh, relatively small subset of candidates. Like for instance, if you are uh, um, want to rank um, uh, articles about machine learning, first you will fetch as a search engine, right? Like with these keywords, like machine learning, and then that will give you a subset of articles, but not necessarily uh, that ranking is not personalized, right? Because anyone, if I if I uh, query like machine learning, and, and if you do, we will receive exactly the same set of uh, articles, but the idea was to then re-rank that, uh, set of articles, but then it's more efficient, right? Because you don't have the whole collection, but rather a subset, and then the re-ranking goes faster. So, and then it was the recommender system part that uh, took like the preference of the users that was represented based on the history of the, of the articles that were read and also partly on the assignment to the clusters. And then we come up with this uh, ranking. And in the end, uh, the idea was to present that in the in a UI uh, for the uh, yeah for the for the editors to select from right. So with this selection and the creation, right? I mean, what we observed is that the the user generated revenue. So the people subscribing to the newsletter and paying for uh, for a subscription grew, and also we observed. Uh, a reduction in the newsletter creation time. So before a, the, an editor creating a newsletter will take one hour to do the job, let's say uh, like by hand, like selecting the articles and then selecting a topic and then making the creation. So with the tool, uh, that one hour reduced to 10 minutes. So it's a huge uh, um, time saving for, for them. And if you observe, when right, in the whole pipeline, there is no user, uh, uh, information or private information that is required to do this uh, personalization and ranking. I mean, of course, if it is a newsletter, you have to share a, a um, an email, but you don't have to share even your your name or your um, 
uh, demographics, right? I mean, it's basically uh, inferred based on the interactions that you will have when you click on, uh, on that uh, list. And since this is assigned to the topic of like uh, the cohort of interest, right, that you belong, then is the person the personalization goes in that group. So it's not uh, possible to identify you directly, right? So, and the rankings that we observed that were generated by this tool, right, uh, was basically at the level of what the human editor would do. So that means that if an editor creates a newsletter and send it to the group, um, the um, click-through rate that is observed in the opinion rates were basically the same if I'm that I'm not an editor, use the tool and send uh, and send that um, newsletter to them, right? So, I mean, that was basically the... Uh, the outcome of this. So, and uh, the whole idea was to enable this disruption and to create a better internet that respects individuals, right? And that was the, the objective. So this is basically what I have for the first part. And I would be happy to, to answer any questions because what I want to show you is something that is more hands-on, like uh, talking about, we have talked about this in embeddings and how they could be extracted. And what I want to is also to give you an example so you can also play around and I, I can share the, the resources uh, after the talk, right? So you can also go and try it yourself. So, but before moving on, I mean, do you have any questions about maybe about this uh, pipeline or any of the steps? Or anything that requires any clarification? Um, hi, it's me again. Hi. So I noticed I did not quite get your question and I also didn't get an answer. So could you mind just um, uh, repeating, not, not repeating, just like explaining the whole scenario? Uh, the, the whole scenario, the, I mean, you mean the whole pipeline? So. No, like uh, you asked me how I have applied um, uh, clustering. Uh, yeah. 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 So I told you about the classification of text into topics models, and then you asked something about a uh, vector, which I didn't quite understand. Oh, yeah, exactly, yes. So, I mean, the thing is that when you have text, right, I mean, and, and I think that that will be more clear when we move to the practical one. So, I mean, uh, if you, I mean, just be a little bit patient and then bear with me. The idea was that you have a text, right? And then you have a representation, right? Because the machines, if you use input text, like it is, like a, like your name or a tweet to a classifier, that won't work, right? Because the classifier requires a representation in a feature that are just a set of feature vectors, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, um, yeah. So I, ho I, ho I hope that this is, I mean, this is basically to, uh, at least the first step to co come up with these embeddings or these um, uh, vectors. The, the whole idea is to have a, um, a representation that is more suitable for the, for the machines, right? So that's, uh, that's the goal. But maybe that's, uh, that gives us a good, uh, um, a good transition to the next, uh, uh, to the next part. Uh, if you have any further yeah. questions, yeah. yes, go ahead, please. Yes. Um, can you? Uh, what what we uh, ask me uh, in, in this so slide, in this step? Ah, oh, yeah. Sorry. Vast. I mean, I was just making the question. Sorry. Um, yeah. Yes. V V double A S. What what uh, it stands for? Which one? This yes, this uh, one here. The first one. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's it's vector. Yes vector as a service so the v is for vector because it's what what it comes in is the text and then you have vectors that comes out so i mean this is like you come the text and then it's a, a vector that comes out of this uh, uh as an output and i'll show you okay. in a minute how, how this could be computed yes okay thank you uh -huh. And if you see, this is the first step because then after we have this vector representing the articles, then we can do clustering, right? I mean, here, this this one works directly on the text, but then you can have also embeddings of vectors for the uh, organizations, uh, for the location, right? For the entities themselves. Uh, the candidate retrieval can also use these vectors to fetch the uh, candidate articles, for instance, if they are similar to each other. And then the re-ranking happen also on the vectors that you have computed in the first step. So, I mean, the first step is very key 
to, to the whole process. But I'll show you, I mean, since uh, there are questions regarding that, I mean, I'll show you um, now. Okay, example. can I ask you uh, one more business question? Uh, yeah, yeah business sure. Side. So, um, uh, how how many uh, could you describe uh, the number of uh, publisher and uh, subscriber? Ah, yeah. So, I mean, the, this. Uh, um, I mean, it is it's in Dublin, so I mean, this is um, um, Silicon Republic. So I think that the the whole sus subscriber level was in the thousand of people. I don't know, like um, roughly ten thousand or a little bit more. Uh, that was for a single publisher. The other one was uh, a, a little bit smaller. So the Dublin Inquirer that we work with, I think that the in ballpark there, you know, the, the subscribers for the newsletter is like ten thousand or so. Uh, yeah, so mostly around that ballpark. So not not millions like the New York Times would have, but that doesn't mean that uh, this won't work on that. But at least the pilot tests we conducted with them. So um, yeah. yes. So um, uh, you say that you, your main focus or your main customers are the publisher, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the publisher because then we can reach a, a broader audience. Uh, you know, so. For instance, we also experimented, and let me show you before moving on then. Uh, we also experimented with um, with a tool um, that is just shown here. We call it Detour, and the idea was to give uh, also readers the opportunity to receive every day a set of articles, five articles that will uh, take your mind out of the pandemic, and that will, that's what we call it Detour at that time, and it didn't require any any kind of uh, email or the you login or anything. Um, the recommender system uh, was actually running on the mobile. So this is a, a different tool that I talked, but it's also using this very similar technology. So the idea that you have uh, this app, right, that you will read, the articles are directly from the publishers, right? We will provide a summary, something that you could bookmark and you have full control, uh, like for instance, deleting the articles that that represents you like uh, the history so they are not reflected in the personalization computation where you have the opportunity to to delete everything and to start over again and so this kind of tool yeah, was mostly like uh, thought for like an end user but the one uh, that i presented in the talk called new brief was targeted uh mostly to publishers so uh, a tool for publishers so they could personalize their newsletters Right, and the main motivation is to give them the opportunity to also make money through uh, personalized newsletters. Because if you're a big player like the New York Times, then you have the resources like a 300 editors dedicated to create different kind of newsletters and that they use, right? They have a, a, around, what, 78 or something uh, newsletters. So, but if you're a small publisher, you cannot have 300 editors, right? I mean, to personalize your newsletter, you need the technology and tools like the one that we created to actually um, uh, create uh, those level, that level of personalization. Okay, okay so moving on. So what I'm going to present is more hands-on. This is probably a kind of um, um, illustrating part of subtasks uh, for the product that we created, but it also gives you the opportunity to play around a little bit. So I mean, I prepared a notebook and then I'll, I'll share the links and everything so you can play around after. So the idea of this, what I call paper rec, I will illustrate now. So um, the recommender system, you basically have these users and items and there should be also, uh, a way to represent, right? I mean, items in the context, for instance, the one that we just described is this text that are coming from articles. In this uh, in this case, that the items, at least for the discussion in this presentation, will be papers, scientific papers that are represented. I mean, it's basically text as we had before, right? And the users, there should be a way to represent the user. I mean, in this case, we will repre represent them as a history of the, of the, uh, papers that they have read before, right? I mean, it's kind of the, your history uh, captures your preference kind of uh, hypothesis. Um, and uh, how to represent the user in items is again, I mean, you ideally you will have a way to represent it as a, as a vectors. Um, the recommender system, one canonical way to represent user in items is through a matrix. So you have in this example, items that are movies that are in the columns 
right? And then you have the users, there are the rows, and in, in the sales are, in this case, the rating of this user to this particular movie. And here, minus one is used either as a dislike or, or, for, or you can use it also as a missing data if you, if you want. I mean, it depends on how you represent. Um, <clears throat> it, this could be also a totally binary matrix with one and zeros, meaning one if you watch the movie and zero if you don't watch it. So and that's basically uh, uh, already a strong signal. And one way to compute the embedding. So I mean, what you want is a representation of the user and a representation of the items will be to factorize this matrix uh, into two, like one that represents the users and one that represents the items. Right? And this is heavily using collaborative filtering. And so this is one technique. So the other technique, and the one that we will use, is trying to use the content uh, of the item because they are rich, they are very rich, right? I mean, there are texts, so there, there are ways to represent them. Right? So again, as we discussed before, right? I mean, if you have a word, if you just input cat, to uh, classify, it, it don't, doesn't understand the, the CAT word, right? You have to represent this word as a vector, right? I mean, and the vectors that you see are embeddings. And these embeddings are coming as an output of uh, what is called a language model, or in nowadays is large language models that have been trained before with a specific task. Usually the, the, the task that they train is to predict what is the next word in a sentence, for instance. Like, uh, if you just give an example, so for instance, the the cat likes to drink. What would be a, a, a good word that goes next? Like the the cat likes to drink. A milk. milk. Milk, right? So I mean, we humans uh, with the language that we had will be like uh, the one of the very uh, likely words that we'll like to to choose, right? And th and these models are trained like this. So you kind of um, uh, take away milk, right? And then you feed the model with the, the cat likes to drink and then the model trains to predict the next word, right? And, and that's, uh, uh, of course, it is an oversimplified way on how these models have been trained, but in the end, you end up with vectors that capture some semantics of the language, right? I mean, and then you have, if you project those vectors in two dimensions, you end up like a cat and kitten are closer, right? I mean, one, uh, Similarity measure will measure this that are very close to each other or similar, and dog will be not th that close to it, but uh, maybe closer than houses, right? I mean, in, in the work that you have done, what similarity measures have you used for to compute between vectors? So, I mean, if you want to say, okay, this vector is similar to the others, what similarity ma matrix have you used? Uh, just one. Hello, hello. Can can you elaborate more uh, on the? Yeah, question? so I mean, in in linear algebra, you have two vectors, right? And then you have uh, like the vector, this one vector, cat, uh, and kitten. So if you want to compute how similar are to each other, there are certain uh, methods, right? Or metrics that you use. So have you used some in your work to compute similarity between vectors? Yes, just, just go ahead and, and tell me, unmute yourself. Yeah, so we have been uh, practicing with the equilibrium distance uh, we implemented the Euclidean, the Euclidean distance and also the quasi similarity. Okay, uh -huh. those are uh, good examples, right? I mean, of uh, similarity, right? I mean, you have, uh, yeah, you can have a clear distance or cosine similarity, and that will give you a notion of how close they are. I mean, for instance, cosine similarity will measure the cosine of the angle of the vector. So if uh, that means that they are, if the cosine similarity is one, is that they are basically identical. And if they are orthogonal, uh, cos the cosine of that will be zero, right? But there are metrics to give you this notion of how similar they are. Uh, <clears throat> one other advantage to uh, to have those vectors is that you can project it, right? And then you do this projection in 2D, you see that similar vectors, right? Like for instance, similar in terms of cosine similarity, 
they end up together. Like for instance, in this uh, machine learning papers, they will end up together to each other. And then you have these topics uh, again, right? And then there will be topics that you can identify, right? And this is, gives you a notion of the structure of the data. And you can do that uh, by using this uh, word embeddings that come from, from uh, this representation of the word, right? which is quite powerful. If you think about it, you, you basically have a model that has been trained to predict the next word, but then you have this kind of semantics uh, that is captured by the model, right? which is quite powerful. So, and this is a way to represent items in recommender system. When right? you have the content, then you don't need anything else but, but that. Um, then um, that's what we are going to use for for this um, for this paper rec exercise, right? I mean, we will represent items with the embeddings, and we will represent users as a collection of the history that. Uh, or some preference or some keywords that the user will give us, right? So, and then based on that, we will compute the dot product of those vectors and that will give me a score. So the dot product is, is um, this or, or inner product, is basically the multiplication of each of the dimensions and then a sum of that. And that what gives me is kind of a, a projection uh, of one vector into the other. And it's basically score uh, a real value that I can interpret of uh, like, um, the preference score uh, for of this of this user for this particular item. Um, the data set that we are going to use is coming from Archive. Archive is this uh, um, kind of repository of scientific papers, and we will focus on these categories here from artificial intelligence, uh, comp uh, computational language, and so on, um, to extract the text from there, and then we will use a model called sentence transformer that if I input the text, it will give me a, a vector, right? And then we will use those vectors to to uh, to work with. So I'll, um, what I'll do is to I'll share a, a notebook so we can go over it and then um, we can discuss from from there. So let me just switch to the the notebook instead, so one second. Um, so I'm sure that you're familiar with Jupyter Notebook. So this is running in also BS, BS code. So this should be, uh, yeah, this, this should be visible for you, right? I mean, if there's not, let me know. So. What we have here are basic um, is basic um, um, imports. So just let me import torch. And as I as I mentioned before, let's see. I don't know if this is should be this or not. So, so let me get rid of this. So um, here I'm just defining uh, uh, where this is located. I mean, I will share the link afterwards, and then you can also have a look, but one important thing to, to see here is that the language model, as I mentioned before, is called the sentence transformer, and this implementation is through uh, the hugging phase. So hugging phase is this library and also a, a platform, so you can run your demos and, and you can also push uh, uh, data sets there that can be then reused by others and by the community. Right? So I mean, let me define this, um, uh, constants there, right? So, so the next one, what it's going to do, we'll basically fetch uh, the model and download it. And I will uh, create a basic, um, this matrix factorization thing, but I don't know if this is um, actually useful for you. So let me let me uh, go back and do a, a, step, a step back before, right? I mean, maybe we focus on the text embeddings rather than that, right? So, I mean, again, we introduced that one and we will use this uh, a sentence of feature structure. And then here you will see uh, how this actually uh, works, right? I mean, we have three uh, chunks of text, T1, T2, and T3. And intuitively, I mean, if I ask you uh, uh, what it would be, uh, like if we take T1 and compare it to T2 and T3, uh, who, do, who would you say, or which one would you say that is more similar to T1? like intuitively, like T2 or T3? 
So 200 countries, climate promises still not enough to avoid catastrophic global warming. T2 is like a game changer, ideas on water and sustainability, Central stage ahead of major water conference. And the T3 is uh, Putin's wild claims of a dirty bomb show just how badly his army is uh, faring. So if you compare T1 to T2 to T3, which one do you say that it was more similar? It would be T1 more similar to one T2? And two. T1 and T2, right. Yeah, right. Uh, why? Because it has uh, some some climate changes in the water and sustainability. I think yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, in tweet, yeah, that's correct, right? I mean, intuitively, we can capture that very easily. I mean, how would you train or program a machine to actually uh, uh, have this intuition, right? It's, if you want to, to program it explicitly, it's, more, it's very difficult. But this powerful uh, natural language processing models or these language models actually can capture this. And I will show you in a second, right? I mean, if we, first, what we're going to do is to compute uh, a representation for each of the embeddings, right? And then I'll, I'll basically call this lang model, the language model. This is sentence uh, transformer. That is one architecture that are used. I mean, someone mentioned GPT-3, right? There are other language models that could be used for representation and then I'll, I'll compute this, right? So, um, but first I have to run the previous cell, otherwise there's no T2 defined. And, uh, and for instance, if I print T1, uh, is that in the embedding, um, if I take the embedding of T1, it's basically this, right? So the embedding is, Future array, right? And if I take the first say five uh, dimensions, uh, <clears throat> it gives me this. So it's basically an array of, uh, of numbers, right? Of uh, real numbers. And the length that is coming here. The length that is coming here is uh, is the length of the whole array. That is 384, 384 dimensions. So that's actually the output of that sentence transform. So uh, this is a way, uh, somebody mentioned cosine similarity. This is a way to compute the cosine similarity. And what I want is to see uh, if our intuition is correct. Like, I mean, if I check the embedding, uh, the, the similarity between embedding one and two and embedding one and three, they are not the same, right? I mean, semi false. And what uh, um, you suggested is that the similarity between T1 and T2, it should be higher than that one. Let's see if the model captured this intuition, right? And it's, uh, yeah, and your intuition is correct. And also, of course, the model is, is actually capturing, right? I mean, let me just print values for you here. What's the value? And cosine similarity gives me a value between zero and one, and those are the values, right? Between T1 and T2 is 0 0.26, between one and three is 0 0.11. So, one powerful thing that you have to notice is that although they don't share a lot of explicit words with each other, the model is still able to produce an embedding that at the embedding level captures this kind of. Uh, relationship, right? This kind of uh, intuition that uh, seems one is more similar than the other, which is good, right? I mean, here the interpretation uh, is not about the um, the values themselves, but rather how they compare with each other, right? So, I mean, so you can say, okay, one is greater than other, is more meaningful than say, what is 0 0.27, right? I mean, it doesn't have, uh, like a direct meaning on its own, but if you compare it with others, then it's kind of uh, those score will help us to rank then the, the articles. And so, and then uh, this is actually it's called sentence uh, transformer because it's uh, it does and perform very well with sentences. But what about if you have more uh, text, right? So one way to to deal with is that you. Uh, split the text into sentences and then feed the sentence transformer and then you do an average of those vectors, right? So that is basically what, what we did. So we have a larger text, we compute the sentences, right? I mean, in this case, sentence would be 
already split like this. So the first three sentences are, are those from a larger text. And then you can compute the sentence, the embeddings of those sentences based on the on the method that we just defined. And I mean this embeddings, what it does is take the sentences, it encode, it encodes uh, uh, each of them and then computes the mean of those for each dimension, right? And that gives you the, the embedding of the whole of the whole uh, text, right? So now you have a representation of the items, right? I mean, and then how to represent the users is basically to put together the embeddings of the history, right? I mean, if you have uh, read, for instance, article one, two, and three, the and then you have already the embeddings for articles one, two, and three, then put it uh, uh, an average of that will give you the representation of the user, okay? And that's what is done. Um, let me show you directly the, the code here. Right? So um, in this piece of code, you don't need to understand everything, but just uh, just I will give you the glimpse where you have to focus, is that um, uh, what the model computes as a prediction is basically the multiplication of the user embedding, that is this collection or this summary of articles of the history, and it multiplies by the item embedding, right? This is basically computing the dot product here. And it, that's basically the score that we get. And just basically with this scaffolding, um, I'll, I will show you a demo that we put together and then you will have uh, uh, more time to explore on your own. So let me first stop sharing this piece of code and then I'll show you the, uh, quickly the demo that we can open for questions. But the first I want to show you uh, uh, online. So let me first find what is my uh, yes, maybe sufficient. Um, so what I just showed you is uh, in a nutshell is this. So we had the documents, we compute the user embeddings. Sorry, we compute the user embeddings through the collection of these aggregate embeddings that come from the items. And the idea is to give this ranking function. So uh <clears throat> so let me just jump to to this uh, demo mm. and this is running again in what is called this hugging phase spaces so the files and versions of this uh are it's very similar to to using a git repository so what i have pushed there is uh this app PI that is called that is using Gradio behind the scenes that, to create these this snippets. And internally, uh, what we have is this kind of recommend function that extracts part of the text, but in the end, it's it computes the recommendations based on the uh, on the output of this. Right? I mean, uh, if you remember, I showed you this recommend that is just the multiplication. So it's what is what is what this thing is doing. So um, if I go back to the uh, to the app itself. <clears throat> this should be... This is stopped. One sec. Okay, I can also show it locally if this doesn't work. It's, it's usually the demos are, are tricky. Just let me try to, to run it locally instead. Right? In the meantime, do you have any questions? Well, I'll uh, just try to fix this. Questions? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, let me check if I can. Wait. Um, 
So, um, any questions from from at least from the explanation? So uh, for for the embedding yeah. side, uh, it's very clear. I don't think we have. Okay, it. okay that's great. So I don't know why it's this current face not working, but I'll I'll show it locally. At least to find it locally. Mm -hmm. So locally here. Um, this is basically the code that I push to the repo. And what I'm doing is basically running it locally um, in um, this machine. So this should open in one port that I'll just share with you instead of this, um, instead of this code. So um, switch to, to the browser instead. Um, so what we have here is um, it's it, what is asking you, right? I mean, so this is a demo. It doesn't have it doesn't have a history for for each of us. So I mean, we have to help it to say, okay, what are our interests? And then here are an example that I can select, right? I mean, this is, for instance, a um, um, the attention is all you need in a, a paper with an abstract. And if I do this uh, submit, so what it, I should get is a, um, Okay, right now it's computing. What I should get is a list of recommended articles that comes that list um, that comes from from this interest of me, right? So this is the paper that I like. I give it to the machine, and the machine comes with this list of uh, papers that I um, that I might be interested in. Right? So what is happening internally is that this text here gets an embedding. And then this embedding is multiplied by uh, the collection of articles in in a file uh, of, of the embeddings of the collection of articles. And then the score from this multiplication is sorted and presented back to me. Right? So you see this list is particular to that interest. So if I clear it and select that I'm interested in guns, efficient models, and art, and do the submit, uh, the list that I will get in a second, uh, it's will it will be a different list, right? I mean, because right now it's capturing this information as my interest, and then offering me a rank of article that is different to any other rank. So I mean, you can see that what you input here could be how the user is represented, and the list that you receive is a, a rank list that is personalized to that interest right so this demo is again public i mean i'll have to see what what's going on with with hugging face at the moment so I'll, uh, and then i'll share the link directly so you can play around uh too right so but that's basically the the in a nutshell how using these embeddings you can come up with a, a simple recommender system a content-based recommender system that does this a personalized ranking based on the user representation which quite is quite powerful i think right i mean it's in a, a couple of lines of code and a single class you can create something something like this okay so um, uh, with uh with these links right and also this maybe we can discuss a little bit um, kind of um uh, uh limitations of this right i mean one is that the paper rec recommends you articles of interest, but of course it doesn't capture this kind of uh, uh, like online behavior if you click or not on that. But I mean, this is something that would be interesting to see. Um, 
The other one is that um, uh, it's, it doesn't use collaborative filtering, although the observation of these click-through rates could also help to complement uh, the work in PaperRec, or, or at least in this um, simple demo. And it will be interesting to explore its different models for representing the embedding. So we are using the sentence model. But uh, if we use, I mean, uh, the question would be if you use GPT-3, I mean, would that help to improve the recommendation task? I mean, that would be a nice project if you want to, to explore more. Some of the things that we observe is that recommender systems is not is different to NLP or computer edition or audio tasks because it requires this kind of a, uh, trying to understand and capturing these extra signals of the user interest and in this personalized ranking that is generated uh, for each user. Right? I mean, so it's not exactly the same task. And, and coming up with solutions to recommender systems that preserve privacy and such would be also an interesting project to pursue. So with that, I conclude. I mean, I'm happy to take any any other questions. And after the talk, I'll, I'll share with everybody uh, the resources so he can share it with you um, after that. I have a small so, question. So, in the paper, yes, please go ahead. In the paper embeddings, uh, how 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 the articles is ranked? Or how how the arc articles is scored? Oh yeah, so the the articles themselves are just scored based on this multiplication between the user embedding and the item embedding. So you have a whole collection of uh, articles, right? That will be, if you think, is the data set. And if you have a vector as a user, right? That, that is basically a summary of this embeddings of your history. Then it's a multiplication between the user vector and the item vectors, right? So in and that will, this multiplication gives you a score. I mean, it's basically a floating number. And after this score, you basically sort them by the score and take the top 10 to recommend. So it's basically a vector against a matrix, a matrix multiplication, and then you get the score. Yes, uh, I, I'm sorry for uh, not clearing my question, but uh, what I want to ask was uh, the item scoring. I understood yeah. that we are multi multiplying uh, the user with the the item to give us a score that with that score will uh, present for like the top three or the top four. So how yeah. how how the scoring of the items is uh, being done? Yeah, but that's that's how you do it, right? I mean, you multiply a vector by an item, and that gives you a score. So I mean, that's the score of your that's the score of your item for this user. So um, let, let's give me let's let's go back to the code, right? So I'll, uh, maybe that help you help me explain a little bit more. So let's, let me stop sharing this one and I'll share the um, the window where I have the thought. So, Seems like we have, have a question, maybe. Yes, in the meantime, I have to. Yeah, I mean, just shoot with the question. So I'll, I'll try to put a light here. Um, it's a very different question from Mohammed. So maybe just finish, and then I'll follow up later. Um, you can you can actually ask it now. So okay, so what it's uh, what is happening here, right? Is in this recommender step. Uh, you have uh, you get the um, you get in the forward part. so here so you have a user embedding right then you multiply it by the set of embeddings of the items so by all of them so and uh, and what is uh, and I can even show you is it uh, my collection of uh, papers you have it here. So maybe it's not in, in the same level. Okay. Anyway, so this multiplication is actually what is giving you the score for the item. And so you multiply this, you get one number, and that number is a score, right? And a higher score means that the, that item is very similar to the user history, and that's what you want to recommend in this case. Does that clear your? Does yeah, that answer your question, Mohammed? Right. So I mean, yeah. and you, yeah. 
So it's very similar to what we have uh, here before, right? Like, I mean, we have, um, uh, uh, maybe I will have to, to, to again run this part, but let me check this. And this embeddings, right? And, but right now, if you think not about the, the, the embeddings, but you call the user is basically a collection of those embeddings. So for instance, the user is basically the collection because it has read T1 and it's basically, that will be his representation, right? So, and then what you want is um, a score for the user in this case, right? Uh, this one between the user and T2. I'm just saying that the user has only read that one. And uh, then what you want is to check, okay, I mean, you want to score this, right? I mean, uh, and one way is to compute this kind of similarity measure, right? I mean, it's, uh, sorry, I have to define the function. I mean, I have to, to run again uh, this one because I close them up. One is that, okay, what am I doing incorrectly? Ah, yeah, because T2 is not the bedding, T2 is the X. So that's the score for U1 and T2. I mean, you can also compute it like in, with the dot product, right? With, uh, with dot product, it would be exactly what we have as a matrix multiplication. I mean, they're normalized, this is equivalent. And uh, that will give you the dot product, right? So, I mean, that's basically what is the score of T2 with respect of user, right? because I mean, right now we are ranking per user. So if you have a different user, the ranking will be different. And then we have the MP dot for user with respect to T, uh, T3 embedding. And that gives you, so I mean, if you take these two, which one would you rank higher, right? I mean, in the recommendation, so you will rank higher T2, right? Because it's higher score, so than T3. So, and that's how you, I mean, in the paper rec, we take the user, that is the embedding of what we input in the demo, and we take the embeddings of all the items, right? We do this multiplication of over the 1,000 items or more that are there, and then we sort them and present the, the highest, the top, right? So I hope that this is uh, uh, clear for you, Mohamed. Yes, it's, it's very clear now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no problem. So the next question was? Um, I just wanted more emphasis on how different the recommender systems are from NLP, CV, and audio tasks. And also, how would you deal with um, complex data if you're trying to um, use a, recomm a recommendation system for complex data. Uh, like, can you give me an example? Uh, like very unstructured uh, data that has uh, texts in different languages, it has images, mm -hmm. it has um, it, it has everything, even a logo, anything. Yeah, I mean, uh, what you usually do, I mean, if, if since there are different kind of, uh, uh, like a multimodal kind of input, so you deal with text separately, right? I mean, you compute embeddings from that text, you compute embeddings for the images, right? I mean, in computer edition, there are similar models like would it, that would extract those embeddings. And in the end, you have a, a set of vectors. I mean, in recommender systems, depending on, on the task, right? I mean, if there are 
there are movies, you actually have this kind of richer content, right? Because you have like the, the description of the movie, some metadata, you also have collaborative filtering embeddings, and you have other um, kind of even the picture of that, right? I mean, uh, but you have to translate them into vectors, right? Once they are in uh, the vector space, you can compute very similarly this kind of uh, um, kind of uh, how what would be the taste of the user because you, it's basically operations between user vectors and item vectors, right? I mean, the the item could be very abstract, and the similar models will apply for other unstructured data too, right? So, you to summarize, you basically compute the embeddings of this different media. And then you can again operate against the the user embedding, right, and get a scores that will help you ranking uh, the items you have. So in some cases, what is done is that you concatenate those representation. Like for instance, if you have text, you have one embedding, like a let's say one hundred dimensions, right, and then you have an image. You compute the embedding out of that, and then there's the next let's say 64 dimensions, and then you put it together, you concatenate uh, a vector, and that's the representation of the item. Um, so that's that's um, that's what I would do, right? I mean, it usually, it usually works well. Uh, okay, thanks. Yeah, no so, problem. Um, currently, the paper just supports documents. Sorry? Ah, yeah. So, I mean, for this example, yes. I mean, it's text is uh, using an NLP model, but it's not restricted to that. And I mean, in the end, what you have here is is uh, like a, uh, if you want a service that compute embeddings, right? I mean, you input something, image or anything, you just have to use a different model. But the principle is the same, right? In the end, you end up with a real value vector that then you can use for the recommender or system or for for classification or for sentiment analysis or, or or any task that you do if you have if you have labels for instance right for that task okay thanks yeah so that's pretty much what i what i had for today and and i'm i'm very i'm very happy to to be here sharing i mean if uh, you have any questions don't hesitate to to reach out and i'm happy to to answer the questions here about this or or any other issues that you might face in your your projects or in your work, okay? So I'm I'm happy to connect too. Thank you very much, Ernesto. This is really amazing, and we really appreciate your time. I think this was really needed. So uh, maybe questions. We still have questions. There's Tiberik. Yes, Tiberik. Okay. Um... Thank you for your great presentation. So the question I have is um, when we are choosing uh, machine learning al algorithms, so um, how can we uh, measure that we are choosing the right one? Like are there, are, are there um, maybe a metric to measure what kind of algorithms to use uh, in a specific uh, situation? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's always depending on the task that you're dealing with and also the nature of your, of your data. So, I mean, if I understand correctly, you, you um, there's some feedback comments. Okay. Can you just uh, mute uh, yourself? Okay. So, uh, again, it depends on two factors, right? The nature of the data and the task uh, that you deal with. Uh, usually for a tabular data, um, if you are able to extract the features like handcrafted features, right? I mean, um, like for instance, if you are dealing with fraud detections of credit cards, sometimes the like context about when the transaction happens, the amount of the transaction, if you have any other uh, contextual information and you basically build the feature vector and then you have the label because this is a, if you treat it as a, as a supervised approach, you have the label of fraud, not fraud. Then uh, what works very well are gradient boosted trees algorithms. Like, I mean, and there are implementations like CatBoost, uh, uh, XGBoost and so on. But in the end, it's this algorithm of gradient boosted trees that works very well for tabular data. For images, um, um, 
and in the last what ten years, there have been a huge revolution of improvement of deep uh, uh, neural nets and those uh, more like um, um, deep uh, models works very well. And I mean, one that excels at least for for uh, many of the tasks is, is what is called UNet, and there are several algorithms that are based around this kind of idea of residual. Uh, connections and unit will work uh, well, right? But I mean, you see, it's a different task, it's a different data. For NLP, this architecture of transformers, and uh, that works very well uh, too. Right? Um, and uh, that's probably would be like the, the way to go if you want to extract automatically this embedding from text using a, a transformer-based architecture, like the one provided by the Hogging Face Library, will work uh, very well. So, so uh, as as you see, there are, there are um, depending on the task and depending on the nature of the data. There is no one single algorithm that works well. But I mean, if you ask me, what would we try? I mean, usually try the one of the simplest one. If you want to understand, like for instance, you build the, the training set if it's tabular data and then use an algorithm like logistic regression for classification just to have a baseline, and then you compare it with a with a more complex algorithm like random boosted trees. Is uh, how you you would approach the the problem, at least for tabular data. I mean, for text uh, and computer vision, these deep learning uh, architectures are are very good. Right? I mean, and then you would go great right? because they are state of the art. There are several of them uh, out there uh, that you could try out. Um, but again, it depends on your task. Can you give me one example on the problems that you are dealing with, um, and what algorithms have you choose? Uh, I'm actually trying to choose one, so um, I haven't decided which one to use, but um, uh, in terms of the futures, we uh, were uh, trying to uh, extract, there is a, an image future and also uh, there are some pics and logos, so we, we are actually working with different kinds of futures, but uh, in terms of the algorithm, we are still in the process of choosing one. And what is it? What is the task? Um, uh, to um, well, it's the, to measure the key performance in the kit. Ah, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. And then um, probably is uh, and are you treating the the task as a classification problem or is it a regression that you want to, like, uh, trying to infer what is the real value, uh, or is mostly like a classification? You have like a, a categories of the score? Um, I I don't think it's a classification. I'm not sure uh, about the... I don't think it's a classification. I think it's more of a regression. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it could be both. Right? I mean, it depends how you cast it. Right? Because the, if you have beans, they could be already like a, like a top, uh, I don't know, like a high, medium, and low kind of classes. That could be one approach, and the other one, if it is a regression and you already have the features, then one again, one of the models that performs very well would be this uh, gradient booster trace algorithms for regression. So you have regressors as, as well, and they perform very well. And but to give it a try in a simple way, and just to give to have a baseline, because it's very important that that you don't use a huge uh, algorithm that is like a like a mechanical hammer, right? If you have just a, a, just a simple nail to to, to hammer, uh, uh, you can use a um, simple linear regression to see how that goes as a baseline, and then compare the results against a more complex model. But if it is regression, that would be the algorithm that I would use, like a linear regression first to see how it goes, and then compare it with a, a gradient boosted tree. Uh, algorithm uh, based regressor. Right? So that's at least, I mean, that's where I would start. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, any other question? Otherwise, we can call it a day. Okay. Uh, I think there's no more question. Uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, maybe you can have someone from trainees to talk on behalf of, uh, of the trainees.
anyone who maybe would love to say something to Ernesto on behalf of trainees, but on behalf of Ten Academy, I think we're really thankful. Thank you for your time, Ernesto. Yeah, anytime, right? I mean, it was a pleasure. So if you want to connect to LinkedIn, just uh, Google me, I'm there, and I will share this uh, material afterwards so you can also have it and play around so i'll, I'll try okay. to to see what's what's the issue in uh in hogging face so you can have a look directly there okay okay i think like and then and then please yeah i would like to thank you on behalf of uh, 10 academy trainee trainees thank you for taking the time to uh demonstrate the practical part of it and uh the uh, pipelines that you use that's very inspirational and educational as, at the same time to see how you're using uh, this to apply in the real world problem so uh, thank you very much for taking the time to demonstrate all your work uh, thank you very much yeah no thank you I mean uh, maybe you can invite me when you demo your stuff right because I mean I'm always eager to learn from you too so if you have a demo or a demo day and you want to share uh, there, uh, please invite me. Of course, of course, we're glad to have you back. Thank you very much. Okay, my pleasure. Okay, then have a nice Friday and happy weekend. Thank you very much. Happy weekend too, Nessa. Bye. Bye.